Julius, uh, you've had a sort of a, I, I think I would say, you know, two very uh, interesting careers that um, I don't know if they've diverged or not, but definitely uh, Mordechai is going to show some of your work. I mean, you are one of the top uh, creators and illustrators um, in Canada. I was. And you were? I was. I yeah. think you in 2004 to devote yeah. yourself to uh, Jews for Judaism. Yes. And uh, the Mordecai can just show, uh, I mean, you you, uh, you, you worked uh, and you, cre you created some of the most amazing pieces and you worked with the best and the brightest. Um, and then uh, you've also devoted your life uh, to the Jewish people. And uh, I think that's pretty amazing. As I mentioned before, you know, usually when you think of someone devoting their life to the Jewish people, uh, you, you here, here are some of the amazing this is not computer generated this is just as this is just old school stuff uh, you know, it's painted this is all before computers this is all before computers um to quote my wife and i quote her often uh ellie don't be an idiot that, that's her famous quote uh, but uh another quote she always says uh about you that you are sort of the norman rockwell of canada and I think that uh, that if you look at these amazing photos, I love the the, the introductory. That's the Haggadah with the, the three three guys uh, schluffing over there. That was the Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur survival kit. The Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur survival kit, which is uh, you know you can't get more apropos than that than that image. But just look at these images. I mean, it is um, uh, amazing. Um, you know, uh, just mind blowing, really. Uh, that you know that you actually sat down on that canvas and it was bare, and then when you're when you're done, it it looks like that. So I mean, it's pretty pretty incredible. And then um, you know you you took another turn in your career, probably because of your life, um, and you uh, you joined. I don't know. You teamed up with Rabbi Michael Skolback. I don't know if you were first or he was first, but really, Jews for Judaism Canada uh, is really you and Rabbi Skolback. You yes that up, and um, you know so. Uh, maybe you can just start off by explaining, because I think when most people hear uh, Jews for Jesus, so we, we get a little bit nervous. You know, everyone wants the best for their children. And uh, when you're uh, when you're Jewish, so, uh, you know, basically you might not think about your Judaism. You want your kids to be successful in business. You want them to have good, healthy marriages and you want your grandchildren to be healthy. And, uh, you know, and then, you know, your, your kid comes home and says, you know, I'm getting more spiritual, but uh, it's not what you think. You know, I, I found passion in uh, Messianic Judaism or Jews for Jesus. And it shakes most people to the core because, you know, most people, they're living their regular Jewish life and not necessarily, uh, you know, Orthodox, let's say, but they, but they identify as Jews. They lived as a Jew. They plan on dying by a Jew. Uh, and, you know, we're Jewish. You know, we, we, we live through Auschwitz. We live through the programs. We live through everything. Uh, we live through the state of Israel. We the highs and the lows of the Jewish people. So when someone sort of is passionate and opts out, it's very it's very earth shattering for parents, siblings that maybe aren't as passionate about Judaism. But like one second, the one passionate person in our family has opted out, and it's probably scary. I don't know. So uh, you can tell us a little about your journey and the family's reaction uh, as the first uh, sort of. How did you come to uh, you know? make a left turn when your family was going down the highway and then sort of uh, what, what, what happened that uh, made you get back on the highway of uh, not the 401, but the Bathurst Street corridor. Okay. So Rabbi, I need to know if I'm doing the condensed version or the long version. How much time do I have? We have uh, 40 minutes, let's say. So let's do okay. a half an hour, but the, All right. there's, there's, a chat, there's a chat on the side and we definitely, uh, as a Jew, I interrupt a lot. So we could be interrupting and we could get some questions on the side. Okay, so listen. So, let's yeah, it's fascinating. Fascinating. Okay, so um, you know, I I grew up in Toronto in a modern Orthodox synagogue, Sher Shemaim on Saint Clair. Went to Cheder there, uh, went to junior services. Um, a lot of times, I I uh, joined my father upstairs in in the main sanctuary in the shul, um, and uh, went through six years of Cheder, got bar mitzvah, and then it was over, which was not unusual for probably most of the people of my generation, most of the Jews of my generation, the, the, the haters were a bar mitzvah factory, and that was the long and short of it. And you got out of there, and, and I'd say 90% I'd say, uh, of my peers from those days uh, 
have assimilated. Um, and that was it. Um, 13 years old, finished with school, and uh, went on to um, enjoy the uh, Canadian culture. Uh, I was uh, fortunate, of, for fortunate enough as a, a teenager to connect a little bit with uh, BBG, uh, AZA, uh, as a Jewish youth group, but it was strictly social. There was, there was no spiritual component. Um, t- 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 high holidays at best. Uh, you know, my parents went... Um, and uh, uh, Pesach was uh, a competition to try and get it uh, over with on time to watch the, uh, pl- the NHL playoffs, which uh, I don't know how much common that was for a lot of people, but it was common for us. And um, the uh, experience was uh, um, one of uh, assimilation. I, I never had um, a strong Jewish background. Uh, my parents were traditional. Basically started inter- interdating uh, as an older teenager, and um, um, there was there was no problem. I mean, the parents were urging me to bring home a nice Jewish girl, but uh, that didn't happen. I, and um, I was able to uh, land a nice uh, scholarship to go to the Ontario College of Art and Design, um, where I uh, graduated with another scholarship. Um, on the uh, day that I, uh, on, on the, the final weekend of uh, my time at the Ontario College of Art, they had what is um, referred to as the open house, where the students would put on display the best work of the of, of the school, if, if you were in that category. And I had my work on display, and that particular weekend, uh, I tried to show my work so that uh, maybe I could land a job, find an art director that would hire me. That didn't happen. What did happen, though, is I found uh, the beauty queen of the school came by, Mary Beth, and started talking to me. And I was not that uh, well-versed with uh, um, dialogue with uh, pretty women. And uh, so she started talking to me, and I was, uh, you know, tongue-tied, dry mouth, clammy hand. But one thing led to another, and um, we talked for an hour. I asked her out on a date, and uh, had such a good time, I asked her out for a second date. On that second date, I couldn't contain myself anymore. And I said to her, uh, Mary Beth, uh, I love you. And that's not the kind of thing you want to do on a second date. But um, she said, you know, cool your jets. Uh, I'm in love with somebody else. And I said, what? You're in love with somebody else? You're going out with me and you're in love with somebody? How can you do this? And so what happened was Mary Beth was an evangelical Christian who had made a boo-boo. She had uh, should have been going out with people who weren't Christians, but, uh, you know, they weren't from and uh, so she needed to uh, correct her spiritual walk and uh, let put Jesus first, which she did with me. And if I was able to buy into it and continue with the relationship, so be it. And that started a process of um, me starting going to go to church with her and going to her um, church socials, to her um, um, family gatherings, etc. And I, I became part of the uh, group. But there was one Sunday service that somehow irked me, and I, I can't remember what the content was other than that it felt very anti-Jewish, very anti-Semitic. And that particular day after walking out of the church, I said, you know, that's it. I was born a Jew. I'm going to die a Jew. I'm not coming back to this church anymore. And by this time, we had had uh, an opportunity to grow in our relationship, and she was very upset that our our spiritual walk had been destroyed. So she found had to find another way of me to get to hear the gospel message. And uh, we're talking about 1976. And at this time, the first Messianic synagogue had started up in Toronto. And um, a Messianic synagogue basically is, is a misnomer. It was a Hebrew Christian church, a, a church that catered to converting Jews to Christianity. But again, they called it a Messianic synagogue in order to um, entice Jews to come and hear the Christian uh, message uh, that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. Um, they had their services on Friday night and Saturday morning, Shabbat services. Um, and the, sh- sh- the, ser- the services were, um, again, ha- having gone through Cheder and gone to synagogue, had a, a little bit of a taste of what, of what uh, a Jewish observance should be. And so when, when you have when you you walk into the service and and they're singing Shalom Aleichem and Hinei Matov and Sisu Et Yerushalayim, you know it's pretty pretty lively. And uh, as 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 they're singing the songs, things calm down. They have a little bit of an orchestra up front with a clarinet and a guitar and drums and a violin. 
the, the, the music service alone is an experience. And uh, but they they stop. They have to light the Shabbat candles. Uh, one of the women puts a kerchief over her head, comes and lights the three candles, which I find later on signify the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They light the Shabbat candles, and they say, shel Shabbat, b'shem Yeshua HaMashiach. Oh, I said, what's this? Yeshua HaMashiach. And then the, the Messianic rabbi comes forth and holds a a, 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 a glass of wine and says, Bore pri agafen b'shem Yeshua HaMashiach. Nochamol, b'shem Yeshua HaMashiach. And, and I, I see what they're doing here is they're praying in the name of Jesus Christ, but doing it in Hebrew. And the, um, but it, you know, it didn't bother me. They're wearing kippahs in this place. They're wearing talaisim. And most of the people were Jewish. And, and, and it was probably one of the most uh, welcoming, friendly, warm, spiritual uh, experiences I had had ever, because uh, you know I, I I never really did get a lot out of my synagogue experience. So I started coming more and more often, and over the course of the year I did, I wasn't one of these quickie conversions. It took me about a year of going to their Bible studies and hearing their um, uh, arguments for why uh, uh, Jesus is allegedly the Jewish Messiah. And they had classes dealing with various proof texts. For instance, they have a proof that says that the Messiah would be born of a virgin. And they quote um, Isaiah chapter 7, 14. Uh, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. And I go, wow, it's in our Jewish Bible. How come, how come the rabbis don't see this? Um, and um, they quote another verse that says that the Messiah had to be crucified. And they quote uh, from, uh, from a Pasuk from, from Tehillim. For dogs have encompassed me, evildoers have surrounded me. They pierced my hands and my feet. So who does this sound like they're talking about? How many, how many people do we know that are famous in the Bible? for having their hands and feet pierced. Sounds a lot like Jesus. Oh, I'm sorry, Yeshua. And um, slowly being exposed to many, many of their proof texts, and they have a lot of them, um, the need to having a, a blood sacrifice for your sins, and that Jesus was the perfect sac sacrifice. These very compelling arguments that they were making. Um, I didn't have a strong background in Judaism to contest what they were saying, but one of the things that the Messianic rabbi would do was point to verses in the Bible that verified what he was saying. One of the interesting ploys that they do is they make a case showing how the King James Version is really a good word-for-word -word proper translation of the Tanakh. Once they show you the verses they want to show you that will substantiate that, then they go on and find the other verses which really are quoted out of context or have mistranslations, but I, I, didn't, I wasn't aware of that. By that time, I had been so convinced that the the Old Testament was the Word of God, that I just needed to be taken along a little bit further. But the process took a year. And it was at a, um, it was at a uh, Rosh Hashanah service in this Messianic synagogue where the Messianic rabbi made a very passionate comparison between the um, binding of Isaac and uh, Abraham offering up his only son and the analogy with God offering up his only son. The drama and the passion and the analogies that were made in this service were so compelling that when they drew the, into the connection of having to have a blood sacrifice for your sins and being asked, where is your sacrifice today? How are you going to be forgiven for your sins? And this, this, this uh, period of time between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, where the Messianic rabbi talks about how Judaism emphasizes tshuva, repentance. How better can you repent for your sins than to have your sins forgiven? And th this is just one message that was very powerful, but you have to understand, here I am, 26 years old, very limited knowledge, very motivated to accept Jesus because I'm involved with this lovely young lady. It's already a year later. But the arguments are very compelling. And, it, you know, a lot of people... Um, seem to allege that, you know, you got to be stupid to believe in this. You, you, you know, there's got to be something wrong with you, or it's a cult. But what they don't realize, what they, meaning the Jewish people who have the misconception of what is really going on out there in terms of the Jews who are being enticed by the thousands, is that the presentation of Christianity for an assimilated Jew is powerful. It's powerful because most Jews have a pintalia inside them. They're looking for what the Christians offer. You know, a lot of people think the Christians are offering uh, um, forgiveness of sins 
or they're enticing you so you can get some kind of freebie. But what, what, what Jews don't realize that the assimilated Jews are looking for that is being offered by these Christians is a personal relationship with God. It's pretty powerful. You, know, you don't hear this in, in shul. You don't, you don't hear um, the rabbi in his, in his uh, Shabbos morning drasha talking about having a personal relationship with God. How is your relationship with God this morning? But you know what? That hits into your kishkes. When you hear somebody come up to you, uh, talking to you, they put your arm around you, they let you know that God loves you. This kind of stuff can be very compelling. And what human being really is so strong that they could say, oh, I don't need God. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty together. I'm, I, I really got it all figured out. We're all weak, and we all need God. We all need to have a relationship with God. But nobody ever has told us how to do it. Here comes along these evangelical Christians that have a formula that really, really works. And what really makes the whole situation very, very powerful is that if we go back 50 years and the situation happens that a Jew is being approached by a Christian missionary, the Jew is going to say, well, I'm Jewish and Jews don't believe in Jesus. But the missionary is going to say, what are you talking about? There's a whole synagogue of Jews that believe in Jesus. You're not alone. You'll be in good company. And the truth of the matter is it doesn't only stop at this one local congregation. Within a year of being involved with this particular group, we started going to conferences, conferences where you would be with hundreds of other Jews for Jesus, with beautiful concerts and wonderful lectures, great, great meals. Okay, so it wasn't kosher, but really, really good food. And the relationships, the teaching, the spirituality, and I have to say that there's some emotion that happens. You start to believe that you're in the right place. It feels good. And the problem is that there's nothing out there to stop you. Now, I'm fortunate that, I don't know how it happened, I had within the Jewish community here in Toronto some real Dracops. They were after me because... I was considered dangerous. I was I was involved with this this particular group here in Toronto. I don't even want to say the name because I don't want to give them publicity. But um, it was a Messianic synagogue. And uh, so, of course, over five years, um, in the particular group that I was involved in, I was doing um, uh, uh, teaching. I would be a choir leader. I would take, uh, we had a choir. We took them out to the choir to churches and in the churches entice those Christians to reach out to Jews. Um, but it was teaching that really uh, broke the camel's back in this particular case. You know, they say one of the best ways to learn is to teach. And I was teaching a one-year course on sharing Israel's Messiah with the Jewish people. And the course involved, every couple of weeks, I would teach a course on a biblical prophecy that Jesus fulfilled and teaching ways of how to share it, how you can share it with Jewish people to make them become Messianic Jews. And a family member had given me a 14-volume Sensino Tanakh, English and Hebrew, with commentary. And I thought it was a great gift. What, what was beautiful about this gift is that it was a correct translation of the Bible. So when I started sitting down and giving a class on the virgin birth and taking a look what the commentary said on the word Alma in this particular passage in Isaiah 7.14 that didn't mean a virgin. It meant a young woman. And the woman the woman is not going to conceive. In the passage, she's already pregnant. And when you start seeing this stuff and you go, wait, whoa, what happened? How did I get deceived? How did I get fooled? They go to another passage where they say the Messiah is going to be crucified. They show, they pierced my hands and my feet. They take the Hebrew ka'ari, which really means like a lion. Like a lion, they are at my hands and my feet. It doesn't mean they pierce my hands and my feet. But to the person who doesn't understand and have access to the Hebrew, but once I started seeing what the Hebrew had to say, I went, whoa, could I have made a mistake? Could I have been wrong after five years of telling everybody that I have the truth? Could I have made a boo-boo? And... I couldn't think I did. And in spite of this, filled with this questioning and this doubt, a Hebrew Christian or Messianic Jewish singing group came to the town that was phenomenal. Um, 
the group was called Colt Simcha from Philadelphia, and I um, helped promote this concert because the idea behind our congregation bringing this this group was that through Jewish people coming to hear the 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 choral group present these beautiful songs, it will help bring more Jews to believe in Jesus and help bring the Jewish community of Toronto closer to um, what we were hoping would happen, the imminent return of the Mashiach. And uh, what I didn't expect, though, was what happened at this concert. I had distributed, I personally, with my artistic talents, had rendered the um, advertising for this um, concert, put posters all over, all over the city, Oh, and the funniest, one of the funniest instances in, in, in those days, Negev Bookstore was around. And in those days, it was before Israel's. Israel Kaplan and Arthur Kaplan were both in, in Negev. For those of you who are from Toronto, you know what I'm talking about. I went in there to try to put up this poster in, in the Negev Bookstore. Boy, did I get a earful from these guys. Anyways, the concert happened, and it was at Northview Heights Secondary School at Finch and Bathurst. And outside was one of the largest... Jewish protests in the history of Toronto. Hundreds and hundreds of Jewish activists, students, senior citizens, everybody out there protesting. I was on the inside uh, taking in tickets as people came in and I started noticing something very peculiar. People were coming in with tickets for our concert, but I was in charge of selling the tickets and I know I never sold it to these activists. How were they coming in with tickets until I finally figured out with my artistic background that these were counterfeit? But by that time, the damage had been done. The place was packed now with these Jewish protesters and they were making a big ruckus, etc. And the one thing after it was all said and done was I walked away with a gnawing, horrible, sick feeling in my stomach about what is it that these members of the Jewish community knew that would make them so adamant that they would come out protest in the way that they did. Could it be that I was wrong? And so I started looking deep and deep into my, into my issues. The doubt that I was having was really reigning supreme. Now, as, as Rabbi Carfunkel mentioned, I was a famous illustrator back then. And my father was a Schneider, a, a, a cloak maker on Spadina. And very frequently I would have a cover of McLean's or Toronto Life magazine or Canadian magazine or this, that, or the other. And he would he would bring the artwork to to the shop with him uh, on, the, on the Monday morning and show his cronies the great work that I was doing. Look what my son did. Look at beautiful artwork he did. Well, this <laughs> after this particular concert, um, it wasn't just a happening. It was an event that hit the front pages of the Toronto Star, the Globe and Mail, and the Toronto Sun. Later on, the Canadian Jewish News, too. And my father didn't get the newspaper. So when he showed up at work Monday morning, all his cronies there, holding up this paper, look at this is your son, the big famous artist, a missionary. My father never knew. I never shared my Hebrew Christian faith with my parents. They didn't know. That particular night after this instant incident, uh, this is a, the concert was on a Saturday you night. Living at home? Sorry. You living at home? Um, no, I was not living. I was not living at home at this time. I'd moved out, and um, we this the concert was on a Saturday night. Um, it was Monday morning that my father had gone to work, where he had this horrible revelation. That Monday night, we were supposed to have a family celebration, and I showed up that Monday night not knowing that my father had seen all this and bringing the cake, and I get to the door, and he wouldn't let me in. He points his finger at me, he says, You're not my son anymore! Get away from here! Just like that, I'm a very good mimic. I was broken. You know, he basically disowned me, and um, it, it really hurt. But this was this was the straw that broke the camel's back. I started realizing that maybe maybe I've made a boo boo. Um, I had uh, a friend of mine, uh, and many of you may know the the uh, dance singer family here in Toronto. A friend of mine, um, Chai, uh, she's now Chai Sarah Brandt, laser dance singer's uh, sister. She was a friend of mine from early teenagers, teenage years. She, uh, when I started getting involved with the uh, the Christianity, she got involved with Judaism. When I got more deeply involved, she got married to a rabbi, but she never let go of the contact. 
She would invite me over occasionally when she came back from out of town, invite me for a glass of tea, come for a Shabbos, maybe a meal. And I would always huck her chinik about the Mashiach, that Jesus is the Messiah. Why don't you believe? She comes to town. She calls me up at this particular point in time. And um, after about five minutes on the phone, she says, Julius, what's wrong? And I said, what do you mean what's wrong? She says, you haven't said a word about your faith. And I said to her, you know, I'm having some doubts. And she goes, oh, really? You're having some doubts? What kind of doubts? And I explained to her what I've been going through, seeing the inconsistencies, inconsistencies with the Christian teaching and Judaism, contradictions in the New Testament, some anti-Semitism, and realizing that maybe I'd made a mistake. But the only person who I could really, really speak to, oh, and she asked me, have you spoken to a rabbi? And I said, well, the only rabbi that I could speak to would be the rabbi that was in the newspaper, because in all these newspaper articles, there was a rabbi in the Toronto Jewish community that represented um, the Jewish voice, and that was Rabbi Emmanuel Shochet. So I said I said to her, the only person that I could really speak to would be Rabbi Emmanuel Shochet, and I don't think he would believe me. And she said, well, you know, he's a good friend of mine. He'll believe me. She called him up that night, made an appointment, and um, after a good four-hour discussion, um, he... Um, we are leaving, and he basically directed me to start learning. He said, you know, you spent so much, five years of your life learning, promoting Christianity. You spent five months of your life learning about Judaism. And then he asked me last minute, you got any questions? And I asked him, I said to him, you know, I, 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 yeah, I, I, got, I, I really feel terrible and guilty about what I've done. What do I do about it? And so Rabbi Shochet explained to me the concept of tshuva. And he said, the best tshuva that you can do, no matter what it is that you've done wrong, is to oppose what you've done wrong. In your case, you've been working to convert Jews to Christianity. The tshuva that you should do is work to try and bring Jews back. And, okay, it's, it sounded like a pretty good idea. Fast forward, over the next eight years, I'm in the office of um, Shalom Schwartz, who was the director of Asia Torah. I'd been doing a little bit of Jewish activism on my own. But I came to him saying, you know, Shalom, we really, we really got to do something here in Toronto. The missionaries are proliferating everywhere. We, we got to produce, we got to produce programs. We got to do lectures. We got to have counseling. We got to have pamphlets. We got to have tape recordings. We got to do something to fight these people. They're, they're winning. And I explained to him everything that we needed to do. I said, you know, it's, it's, so we can do it on a low budget. And and Shalom said to me, you know, I'm sorry, you know, we, we can't help you. We don't have the expertise. We don't have the money. But I do know somebody who can help you. I went, who? And he said, you. And then the light bulb went off in the head, and I said, I guess I'm it. And so that was that was the point where I started becoming official. Uh, started established Jews for Judaism in 1989. Uh, picked up uh, an incredible rabbi, Rabbi Michael Skobek, in 1991. And as they say in the movie business, the rest is history. And uh, thank God, you know, after our first year, we did our first program in 1989 at the Zionist Center on Marley. It was called The Missing Jews. It was a, a program where we went over two nights, did a whole counter missionary seminar over two evenings. And over the course of that first year, we were so proud that we had about 3,000 participants that attended our programs, had come for counseling, had asked for literature, which was a phenomenal number. Can you imagine it affecting the lives of 3,000 people one year? Put even a greater fast forward, 31 years later, we're just on YouTube alone, reaching 5,000 people a day. It's unbelievable. We're getting inundated now with um, emails, with phone calls. From, uh, people are seeing the light. And I, 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 I like to proudly say that so much of the success behind the organization has been Rabbi Skobek. Rabbi Skobek is a phenomenal teacher. Um, he's, he's, he's spoken for you many times at the, at the Forest Hill Jewish Center. You know what I'm talking about. But it, it, he is a, he's a bit of a rock star on, 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 on doing the kind of counter-missionary work that we're doing. And um, so um, people ask me, um, Julius, you know, you're getting old. <laughs> it's, it's pretty obvious. Uh, what are you going to do about retirement? And I said, are you kidding? Retire? You know how much nachas I'm getting from doing this work? Retire? What am I going to do? Sit on the couch and, and watch football and drink beer? No, no, no. I, I see that what we're doing through the combination of 
our experience. Rabbi Skobek also has an interesting counter-missionary story that motivated him to try and fight this same problem. So the combination of him and me, um, we're a pretty passionate uh, pair. Um, we're making an impact. And if it's just two guys, you know, if you take a look at Rabbi Skobek, it's pretty short. He, but I was just average guys at the two heights. Are average. Two average guys making a big in, in, impact. Can you imagine how much more of an impact we as a Jewish community could do if each one of us said, you know what, I want to be a Jew for Judaism. I want to be a person that reaches out to another person and say, come on, let me talk to you about having a personal relationship with God. That's not the kind of stuff you hear too often, but that is what people are looking for. They're looking for, they're, we're not looking for the hocus pocus, and we're not looking for, the, you know, there should, somebody should be a Talmud Chacham, but the simple basics which we have accessible to us in, in our shuls and in our shirim, um, it's something that that Rabbi uh, Carfunkel probably agrees with me a thousand percent and would love that more people should knock on doors and say, yeah, show me how I can have a personal relationship with God. But that is that is that is the uh, that's the sales pitch with the missionaries, and we got to steal that sales pitch and start using it ourselves. So, what do you think? Um, I think it's amazing. I'm looking for some questions on the side. I just I'm just wondering, like, um, you know, when you got uh, you know, I don't want to say sucked in because you voluntarily went to these things. Um, you know, the internet didn't exist. So do you find that uh, it's it's the same game? People just are, they see their, their synagogue is, is apathetic. They see their siblings and their parents as living like, you know, um, sort of regular Jewish lives. And, and it's the same type of uh, passion that the uh, Messianic synagogues have that draw people. Can people go, like, how do people get sucked in when there's so much kosher information on the internet you know what you, you you're deceiving yourself um because if you even just type in the word kosher into google half of what you're going to get is not kosher but but hebrew christian so it, it, it's a dangerous place the internet in that regard and it's probably one of the reasons why so many people are um being sucked in i see i see that even with our own videos that we have on youtube when people are going online People from the people who are Jews who are involved in Christianity and end up finding our stuff accidentally. They, they'll type in some keywords and get our videos pop up in much the same way as that happens. And we are able to rescue somebody. The converse happens when a Jew, let's say from York University, is studying comparative religions and he or she goes to the computer and types in um, kosher or synagogue or high holidays. Unfortunately, a lot of the results that come up are not Jewish. They're Christian. But to an untrained eye, you don't know that. And by the time you end up spending a half hour, an hour researching to one of these websites from one of these Hebrew Christian groups, you're already being sucked in just by the power of their message. Um, I think I think that we as a Jewish community have a, a very, very big challenge because so many of us are just coasting along and you know the 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 concept of outreach is like uh, almost like unknown for many individuals but that is what makes the christians so successful as opposed to you know uh, the jewish community each individual christian has accepted upon themselves the mandate of the moniker of christianity the moniker of christianity is for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe, and blah, 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 blah. you got to convert people. you got to convert people. And there's an extra moniker in, in, in Christianity which says that they're not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first, and then the Gentile. So you've got, you've got these, these Christians who are, for, number one, motivated to convert everybody, and then two, directed first to convert Jews, it's it's really powerful, and th that is their primary modus operandi. It, it's 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 frightening. We, many of us in the Jewish community, and I when I got involved with the Jewish community, I'm, I I found um, my experience through groups like Orsameach, Eshet Torah, Chabad Lubavitch, phenomenal, and it was it was you know I, it was a, 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 a rude awakening to actually meet Jews who were not afraid to talk about God. I, I hadn't experienced that as as a kid. Um, I, it was a new phenomenon, um, and all of a sudden, it made Judaism appetizing 
and delicious. And it's, it's something that um, uh, uh, my experience was that was rare. Now things have changed. The whole um, Balchua movement has been um, a, a catalyst in making a huge difference in the lives of many Jews today. I mean, I mean, when I come when I when I when I came into uh, Asia Tour the very first time, I was 31 years old. So it's, uh, it's 50 years ago, and things have changed. But uh, we got to keep changing. You know, you talk about. Uh, sorry, I'm just. Did you find that the millennial experience is uh, the same? You know, uh, I I think that I don't I don't know if I've always said that uh, that just the the drive to be sort of. Uh, you know, existed back then, 20, 40, 60 years ago, every Jewish kid had drive. Um, and so the drive might have taken them to business, it might have taken them to spirituality, and spirituality might take them to Jews for Jesus. Do you find that there's just less drive in the world? Like, do you, like, are people just not interested in Hashem, not interested in Jesus, not interested in anything? Like, do you find that the millennials themselves are just less problematic because they're not into anything? I'm not an authority on millennials, but I I do have a I do have a daughter who's 25, and uh, I see what's going on, and I think I think you're hitting the nail on the head. I think there's there's there there is a frightening apathy. It's very rare. I I, I find it. Uh, you know, when when we when we were younger and we we went to college, university, whatever we chose, I, I find it hard not to have a passion to do something. You know, you you started off this discussion. With my success as an illustrator, um, it, it it wasn't so much that that was what I wanted to be. It's just like I I I I had it inculcated in me uh, from my parents to, to to strive and do your best at whatever you do. But somehow I think there's something horribly missing amongst many young people today. You know, I'm not saying all, but from what I see, there there is a, there's an apathy. And and again, you know, the, the analogy could be made from what I used to do was paint with a paintbrush, one stroke at a time. Now people just push a button and everything's there in front of them. Um, things have changed with the whole digital revolution, with the with with what's happening in in um, in, in cyberspace. Um, so many people have relationships on their devices. It's, and I go into shul and I see this. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people on the, in the shul they're, they're just stopping on the device, but I don't know. I, somehow there's there's some scrolling going on there that it doesn't look. I don't know. I just I don't. Ha I, I I have a flip phone, so I don't know from devices. But um, I I I think that today's and again today's millennials, um, and again I'm not a Thori on it. Um, there needs to be something out there to inspire them to go beyond the status quo. And I gave an analogy when I was teaching at the Ontario College of Art. You know, it's one of the things you didn't mention much of, but it was probably my most favorite uh, career. It was teaching young people for almost almost three decades. And a lot of the young people would, you know, say to me, Mr. How do, how do we become good? How do we become famous? And, you know, and I, I tried to come up with an analogy of what worked for me. And I and I and I and I and I use the analogy of a ladder, and the ladder goes up, way up. You can't see the end of it. It goes high up, all the way up there. But that's that's where you want to go. That's that's your goal to get to the top. How do you get there though? If you look at all the way up, you'll never make it. And I said to the student, you know, forget about where that ladder's going. You know you're going to get there, but the only way you're going to get there is just to take one rung at a time, only one rung at a time, and that rung is where you're at now and make the most of it make it count make it happen make it relevant make it significant make it meaningful make it personal and then go to the next one whatever your choices are it could be that you're going through um, firefighting school it could be that you're going through medical school it could be that you're a great carpenter it could be that you're a wonderful artist it could be that you're an incredible social worker it could be you might be a rabbi could be that you might be a Rebbitson, but you know what? Go for it and do one step at a time. I take a look at, at I, I've just been through a very, very, very tough few days. And I, I just can't believe how much we've accomplished, I've accomplished. But if I would have looked back just a few days ago at what, what I've done without going into the details, I couldn't do it. But just keep pushing one step at a time. And whatever our goal let is. You, uh, let me ask you a couple of, uh, see some questions on the side. 
just in, in one minute, uh, uh, just some rapid fire questions. Um, question on the side here. Uh, given what you said about the commitments uh, about Christians to convert Jews to Christianity, uh, should we be concerned about the quote unquote love the evangelical Christians have for Israel? Yes. Should I say more? Uh, yes. Okay. Now, Rabbi Skobek. Well, Rabbi. No, I just going to say Rabbi Skobek has an incredible video on this called "The Trojan Horse: The Evangelical Support for Israel." It's it, and this Trojan. It 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 is it, it, it basically is a double-edged sword. On one hand, we appreciate the love, and the problem is, if you understand the mo motivation for many evangelical Christians to show their love for Israel, it's because they want to see the Jews of Israel converted, period. But that doesn't mean all Christians share that. But having been a Christian, having broken bread with Christians, having sat on some of the original meetings of the International Christian Embassy here in Toronto with the original founders and listening to their passionate reason for why they want to do this, their primary reason was, and this is, I, I, I say this about the International Christian Embassy. I say this about uh, Bridges for Peace and there are many other organizations, all who want to show lots of love. But I'm going to tell you, um, the, 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 the uh, quote that comes from the New Testament comes from Paul. And I remember I was at one of the meetings of one of these groups. And I asked the leader of this group after he gave a very passionate speech about how it's so important to support Israel. He didn't know I was a Jew. He didn't know I was from Jews for Judaism. And I just basically had a little schmooze with him. I said, like, what's your motivation? He says, it's what Paul taught. It's what Paul taught in the New Testament. Paul taught the real reason why we have to do this. The reason is to provoke the Jew to jealousy. Jealousy of what? Our Christian faith. So, you know, a lot of people don't realize that it, missionaries are often successful, not because they're handing out pamphlets, not because they are sitting there going through Bible verse after Bible verse. They are being really nice, really loving, really kind. And it might, that the, the, the actual gospel message might not come right away in their relationships. But when that particular missionary leader said that the goal was to provoke the Jew to jealousy, what that told me was, is as much as I appreciate the uh, generosity and the kindness of many of these Christian groups, I know from my experience, it's very hard to draw the line between which ones are just doing because they love Jews and they want to help and they appreciate that God gave the land of Israel to the Jewish people. And how many are using this for a, a prelude to bring about and hasten the return of Jesus Christ in the end times, which is what they believe. And uh, yeah. it's a it's a double-edged sword. When you, when you talk about, so, so, you know, I'd, I'd say like there's, I think there's 2 billion Christians in the world. There's, I think, 8, eight or 9 billion 2. people 2 in, billion. The world, yeah. in the world. 2.2 .2 billion. And 1 billion Muslims. And there's, uh, and, and so when you, when you think, think about, uh, uh, you know, other big people on the pie chart that not necessarily... Uh, believe in you know monotheism uh christians and muslims they, they basically that's 100 percent of the monotheistic world i mean the other four million might be you know uh, believe in uh, other things um how many of those people like the, your average uh co-worker that's christian i mean is that something we should be scared of or they're just regular people like us and you know like are we, you know should we be scared of everyone or you know, I, I'll give you an analogy of um, the caregivers that I hired from my father. My father uh, was uh, in Baycrest for many years, and uh, two of the three caregivers I hired for my dad's care were evangelical Christians. But I interviewed them, and I got a sense that they weren't out to convert my father. They were out to be the incredibly great people they are. And, um, and to, to this day, uh, my, my father passed away, I love shalom. Uh, four years ago, and I've recommended his caregiver to other people who were so happy with him. And I know, and, and she's a pastor in her church. Um, so you, it's a, it's a, you, you, would, you would think, isn't this a contradiction? No, because she knows what's um, out of bounds and what's not. And she's one of the few that um, uh, I find is a remarkable example of a, a Christian that I think is uh, uh, on our side. But it, it, it's hard to it's hard to know that you know I've heard I heard I've heard the opposite stories of caregivers that are taking care of, of, of family members and kids and 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 proselytizing, 
So it's hard to know. But one thing I, I have to say about... Yeah. The one thing I have I to say... say I, I had a, I, yeah. The one Sorry, thing, I interrupted. The one thing I have to say about working with a, 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 a serious evangelical, a serious Christian yeah. who is not proselytizing is you know that they, at least their, their foundation is on the same uh, Torah principles that uh, Jews uh, uphold, which is important, you know, the, the, their values. And so I'd, to me, that made a big difference when it came time to finding just the right person for my dad. I want to make a statement and then ask a question. My statement is, first of all, um, you know, so we uh, actually caught one of our uh, cleaning ladies uh, t telling one of our, I think the kid was still in a high chair, so maybe two years old, uh, saying that, you know, you should thank Jesus uh, for, for life and stuff like that in the rabbi's own home. And uh, so... Uh, uh, you know, it is something that that does pop up. I mean, my 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 kid, uh, I don't think was uh, negatively affected, but uh, it, it does happen even even in the holy rabbi's home. Uh, so here's my, here's my question: Is that you know, th there's that famous verse that uh, that Jesus is going to be born from a virgin uh, mother, and um, and it, it's to me, you know, it's so obvious it doesn't say virgin there. It's it's a misquote. If that's their main proof text, I mean, if someone came to me and said two plus two is five, and then I explained to them, no, 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 two plus two is four, um, it's it's game over, it's checkmate. So the to me, like the certain the the ABCs of their proof texts are are incorrect. Are they still using them? Are still are people still? Yeah, well, you're not, for, you're, 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 you got to understand. I've I've simplified it very much, and and they have. They have, they really, they claim they have hundreds of proof texts. I, I, I would be remiss to say that these one, these two little proof texts that I've just given examples of are the reasons why I would believe in Christianity. Their, their presentation is brilliant. And if you take a look at the people who are running some of these organizations, they're brilliant. There's a lot of smart Jews who are involved in this work. And, um, and the scholarship that's in it is pretty, pretty intense. Um, you know, Rabbi Skovek spends a great deal of time trying to unravel all this, but, and, and, and we have, and he's, we've got a, we've got a counter missionary seminar, a 15 part counter missionary seminar on, on, uh, that we deal with. Only one small portion of it has to deal with that particular verse, because there are many, there are many, many proofs. And, you know, the truth of the matter is, um, there's a lot of different theological arguments. Again, they're going to go, forget the virgin birth, they're going to ask, you know, the whole issue of uh, salvation from sin. How are you forgiven for your sin? And they focus on a passage in, in the book of Le Leviticus that says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. So where's your blood atonement? A lot of Christians will ask this. Um, the, the, Torah, the Torah has it right there in it. Um, if, if you don't have an understanding of what the response is to some of these, these uh, uh, questions, it, it could be very compelling. And it was compelling for me when I, when I first got involved. Um, there are many, many arguments. The whole, I, 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 again, I, I, I didn't come on to uh, give a counter-missionary seminar tonight, but what I, right. what I do is when I, I give a talk, I, I just cite just a few examples. But the examples are a, a red flag as to how each single argument by these missionaries um, can be um, debunked. But Rabbi Skobek is online. He's got, he's got hundreds of videos online debunking arguments, but there's so many arguments. So, so the question is, uh, what I find when it comes to getting Jews out of Christianity is um, sometimes it ain't about the arguments. Sometimes it's we got we got to remove the Jew from the Christians. And one one of the things that Rabbi Shochet told me, advised me, implored when uh, he I left him that evening many years ago, he said the one thing that's going to make or break your success at coming back to Judaism. He says, you cannot have anything to do with these Christians. You have to literally cut yourself off and remove yourself from them emotionally and socially completely. That was a tough thing to do because I had already done that to the Jewish community when I became a Christian. And so for five years, these Hebrew Christians, these Messianic Jews, these Jews for Jesus were my friends. And all of a sudden, Rabbi Shochet says, you got to stop it. You got to just cut like a razor blade everything. And that was a very tough thing to do. But um, it was, I was able to, by removing myself from that, start taking a look at the clarity of what Judaism has to say. And when you take a look from a different perspective, what the Christians are teaching, 
you start re realizing while they do have some good arguments coming from a perspective, a perspective that doesn't rely on having a Jewish foundation, it's pretty good. Like, you, you, it's, 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 it's not a coincidence that there's 2.2 billion um, Christians in the world. And you take a look in, in, in America. Uh, America is a very Christian country, but they estimate over a um, uh, third of the country are evangelical Christians. These are people who go to church on Sundays, they go to Bible studies, and, and, and they marry amongst only the... Uh, the, the, the they, they, it's very, very powerful, and the the answer to our and, and it's it's not going to go away go away overnight, but the answer to um, our quest for trying to not only counter Jews who are uh, counter missionaries trying to convert us, the Muslims are trying to convert us, the Hindus are where Jews are going where Jews are going into all kinds of religious pursuits, and the 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 answer to this question actually is uh, uh, I think summarized by a story. Uh, of Rabbi Skobek at, Win at, at Windsor University. He was. One second, Rabbi says, sorry, says what I want to do I'm not a rabbi. I'm just a schlepper. Uh, I'm not a rabbi. So I want Rabbi Mordechai to take over. I have a. I'm doing a Zoom shiva in one minute for a family that uh, just. Uh, they're unfortunately in their first day of shiva, so I'm going to be heading to that. Rabbi Bookbinder's taking over. Are you a rabbi? No one's a rabbi. Okay. Uh, Rabbi Bookbinder, if you can take over, Jill, because I, I I want this to continue. Um, everyone, please continue asking on the chat. And please, Rabbi, my sis, thank you. Sorry, Julius, I want the pictures for my wedding. <laughs> okay, I got I to gotta find them. Okay. I'm glad I wasn't yeah, I'm glad wedding. I was a photographer. You should know Julius did pictures for my wedding. And uh, I told him the other day that we have one of the pictures right here uh, in my hallway. So I still owe you one, Julius. All yes, right. so th there were a few other questions here. I think the, the crowd will find very interesting. What's the most successful way do you find of removing someone who's enmeshed in Jews for Judaism? Jews for Jesus or just for Jews for Judaism? Jews for Jesus, sorry. <laughs> Days. <laughs> you know what? There's no one. One six. In every case is different. You first of all, when you when you uh, uh, when you take a look at who's involved, uh, you have to ask um, what is the reason why that person is involved. Generally speaking, almost ninety nine percent of the time, the person did not get involved in Christianity because of the proof texts. The not get that was going to be my saying. This is this is the, the Rabbi Skobek will reiterate this particular reason. Usually, there's when a person is already you have to you have to understand the context of what's going on. You do not see Baba Ver Hasidim becoming Jews for Jesus. Why is that? You don't see Chabad Lubavitch becoming a, a, a part of that. You, you don't see it. You don't see Satmir Hasidim. You don't see it. Who is getting involved? Are Jews who? have very, very little background. If you And I've watched so many of the testimonials of these individuals, and their testimonies are not much different than mine. They, they had a Jewish upbringing, and they, have, they were bar bat mitzvahed, and maybe they went to shul on you know, Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, and the, and the parents made a, 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 a Pesach Seder. But really, there was nothing substantially Jewish about their lives. And, and it, 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 it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see the state of assimilation here in North America. I think, I think intermarriage now in in some North American cities is above eighty percent, and that is hap that is happening, um, and because there there are Jews who are um, not interested in following our tradition. I was going I was just going to say a story about Rabbi Skobek. Rabbi Skobek was asked this question at the University of Windsor. He was giving a counter missionary class. He was invited to speak on the topic. And he started giving the uh, background to the missionary problem. And after about five minutes, one of the students got up and said, Rabbi Skobek, you know, we're really not interested in hearing about missionaries. So Rabbi Skobek says, okay, that's fine. So what do you want to hear about? So the student says, I want to, yeah, we want to hear about why can't we marry somebody who's not Jewish? And so Rabbi Skobek said, okay, it's a good question. But you're asking the wrong question. And the student scratches the head. What's the right question? Rabbi Skobek says, the question you should be asking is, why be Jewish? That's a good question. Why should I be Jewish? Especially if you're born Jewish, why should I be a Jew? And therein lies the whole issue. We're coming, we're coming, you know, we're around the bend to the Pesach holiday. And I just find Pesach is such a warm, rich, um, ripe opportunity to share the case for why be Jewish. Our, our story is so amazing. 
I mean, you know, if you just take a look at, at, we talked about other religions, every single other religion, everyone in the entire world started with a revelation of one person, with the exception of the Jews. The Jews, the religion starts with a revelation of three million. That's quite dramatic. And is there something to be argued about that maybe we should look into this uh, chain of tradition that's been passed down for 3,333 years? That's how, that's how long it's been since we received the, uh, the Torah. I suspect what you're saying really is that it's not so much the intellectual argument that sways the uh, people to join uh, Jews for Jesus, but it's more the emotional uh, support that they receive. And it's usually, the you know, we have a similar saying in, in uh, Yiddishkeit. We say, more than the Rav's drusha brought the members close, the Rebison's children really brought them in. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. You know, it's true. Rabbi Skobek had an interesting, uh, I, I, I keep on telling Rabbi about Rabbi Skobek because, uh, listen, in, in, in our organization, he's the brains, I'm the brawn. I'm behind the, behind the scenes doing stuff like you do at your organization. Um, but Rabbi Skobek has... Um, uh, an incredible story where he had uh, counseled a very, very uh, well-seasoned Hebrew Christian. This person was al already involved for almost 50 years. And and he convinced the guy, you know, that he, he's, he's wrong. And the guy said to Rabbi Skobek, he said, you know what? You're right. But I got concrete boots. What are concrete boots? You, know, you hear in some of the uh, crime stories in New York when when the when when they wanted to dispose of uh, somebody, they they you put the feet, the boots into the concrete, throw them into the ocean, into the, the finished. He says, "I got concrete boots. I'm I'm stuck. Why do you get?" He says, "I'm I'm the messianic pastor of a, a messianic rabbi of a congregation. I'm an author. I I teach in a Christian school. Um, my wife is involved in this. I have children who are involved. And he says, and I have messianic concrete. Yeah, what am I? Is, 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 even though his 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 tzeichel was telling him he's he's wrong, he says I'm stuck. And you you got a lot of people getting involved. I'm, I'm, I cite for you the whole issue of inter, intermarriage here in North America, uh, where uh, a third of the population are evangelical Christian. There's many others who are other Christians. When a Jew gets intermarried in North America, highly likely he's he or she is marrying a Christian, and highly likely that Christian has a strong evangelical background. So it's highly likely that if there are going to be kids, it's highly likely the kids are going to be brought up more Christian than Jewish. Not all the time, but I'll give you I'll give you I'll give you a story what happened. I I spoke at a uh, I won't say a a very progressive synagogue in Phoenix um, about 15 years ago, and I was invited to speak to the the Sunday school the kids the kids and the um, the kids and the parents were learning together, and I was speaking on the battle for the Jewish soul, my, the reason uh, why Jews for Judaism is in existence. And I gave the story about the missionary problem. And when it was over, the the principal of the of the Sunday school came over to me, and she was livid. She was red as a beet. She was so angry. Why was she angry? She, she said, "Mr. Sis, don't you realize that a third of these kids have a Christian parent? How was I supposed to know?" And I'm invited by to, to uh, okay, so it was a little progressive, but my job was to give my give my message. But I did not know that a third of these kids had Christian parents. This is a synagogue, so if this is what we're dealing with in America, um, and this was 15 years ago. I, I have to assume it's gotten worse, um, and, and this is a big problem. So how do we reach all those Jews who are just melting? And it, the, the 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 acceleration of this assimilation is frightening. It's it's going at warp speed. Have you been found to be the most successful way of reaching out to people? Sure. <laughs> you know what? It's not a joke. A Shabbos invitation. You know, when you sit down, you get you have somebody come to you and know, people have such a misconception of what Judaism is. They do. And you know they, they, they all it, it's all I'll, I'll just cite from my own experience going into Coming into Judaism, the very, very first time out of Christianity, I went into one of the more religious synagogues in this in the, in Toronto, where everybody's dressed in black, everybody's got beards, and like I felt like so, ugh, it's like it, it's so uh, alienating. And if, if you don't, if, if that's what you think all Jews are, then it, it it can't it can't be a bit of a distortion. Now, Mark, you know as well as I, Mordechai, that that there is a broad spectrum of ways in which Jews can celebrate 
Judaism. It just is. You and I both do it differently, but we're on the same page. So, and, and this is one of the beautiful things about Judaism. Um, the problem is, how, it, it, how do we get that message across? So when you get somebody to the Shabbos table, and this is why I really hate COVID. You know, prior to COVID, it was just so fantastic to have somebody at the Shabbos table. The next week, it would be somebody else. And you could just, you know, let loose and, and talk about stuff and, and have a nice Dvar Torah and have a discussion about the Parsha and, and, and ask a question about Kashrut or ask a question. You know, it was, there was stuff going on. I really missed that, 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 that. And I'll be so glad when COVID is finished, we resume that. But, um, but that, that people need to be exposed to who we are on the real side. It's, it's how the Christians work. You know, they, they, if, if, if you think the Jew converts to Christianity because they went to a church and they heard the message and everything's history. No, it's the people. We need, we need to get, we need to get um, our Jewish uh, brothers and sisters back inside and, uh, and connect with them and have relationships with them. And it's, it's not so easy, but you know, I, 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 I speak from seeing what is successful. I, I not that there's no one flavor for and I'll, I'll give you another story um i was um i mentioned to you i was involved with asia tour for many years they were on wilson avenue i think uh, that's where i met where met you originally and um i was speaking rosh hashanah about my story and and in the question and answer session afterwards um we, we were talking about you know one of the questions was like well we want to be a Jew for Judaism. You got to be more Jewish. So one of the one of the gentlemen in the um, in the audience rose up a hand and said, "Mr. Sis, you know, we got a big problem with what you've had to say because I was saying, you know, a good place to start in your quest for Judaism is starting keeping Shabbat." And uh, he said, "You know, I can't keep Shabbos." I said, "Why can't you keep Shabbos?" He said, well, "I work on Saturday." Oh, okay. So so you, so so you're trying to tell me that because you work on Saturday, you can't keep Shabbos? Yeah, that's right. I said, so let me ask you a question. Um, do you work Friday night? No. So why can't you keep Shabbos on Friday night? And he went, I can do that? And I said, listen, you know, it's not all or nothing. Everything you do is important. He was shocked. And again, that's it. You, you don't want to advertise you can do just Shabbos in increments. But he, once he found out that he could do something for Shabbos, it's better than nothing. This fellow, by the way, once he started going to shul, and once he started keeping Shabbos Friday night, even though he was working on Shabbos, eventually gave up working on Shabbos and became Shomer Shabbat. But you know, you got to. It's 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 it, it's somebody starts keeping kosher. They don't transition from eating uh, uh, pork and beans to 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 going to a kosher restaurants. It just doesn't happen that fast. Okay, so they they stop eating the trafe meat. They, slowly, it's it, it's it's not overnight. But every person is different. And you know what? You won't know how different each unique person is until you get to know them. And I think that it's about relationships. We, we Step by step. Let me just ask if there's anybody else who has any questions. Uh, I'm just looking here on the side if anybody has any other questions that they want to ask uh, Julius about his fascinating work and the state of uh, Jewish affairs in, in Toronto and maybe what, what we can do. But by the, by the way, you know, the state of Jewish affairs in Toronto is, is a misnomer. It's the state of Jewish affairs in the world. So that, yeah, although we, uh, I'm sitting in an office at Lawrence and Bathurst, things have changed. And uh, well, if, this, if this interview was taking place 30 years ago, we could say the state of affairs in, in, in Toronto. But it, it, we are global. Uh, everything we are doing now at Jews for Judaism is global. It's worldwide. It's international. There are no borders anymore. Um, um, when 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 I when I check my YouTube results and statistics and analytics at the end of the day and see whether with six thousand people or seven thousand people that we've reached that particular day, these people are coming from all around the world, and it's uh, you, we uh, the 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 outreach that we do, and, and and you must be experiencing this at the Forest Hill Jewish Center. Uh, you, we're doing this now. Uh, um, here and you're in Toronto and I'm in Toronto, but who knows how many people are watching this from uh, uh, places um, around the world. I'll give you another example, by the way, around the world. We got an email once, once from a Jew who was um, um, stationed at a scientific research uh, s s station in the Arctic Circle, close to the North Pole. And he was at this our, uh, scientific research station with three other people, all of whom were evangelical Christian. And they were all bombarding him, and he didn't know what to do. And he went online, found Jews for Judaism, sent us an incredible email, and said, you know what? 
I'm probably the world's further most Jew for Judaism you'll ever see, but thanks to you guys, I'm Jewish. Because he was able to come online, like they didn't invite Rabbi Skobek up to the North Pole to give a talk, but they did. He was able to get him online with the internet, and we were able to keep Jews Jewish at the North Pole. That's pretty good. I haven't got a letter like that from the Arctic, Antarctic yet, but I hope we get one soon. All right. Julius, you are doing amazing work. Yishkaich, thank you so, so much. You know, we're, we're, we're very appreciative of all that you do for us, not just here locally, but like you said, internationally. You're yeah. bringing uh, people back into the fold, and that's amazing well, you stuff. Well, should know, you should know something, by the way. You know, you're also a supporter, and many other people are supporters. And uh, one of the things that we have to emphasize is we are not in this alone. Every person that helps us out, whether that's uh, an $18 donation or greater, every Jew that helps us out is helping keep Jews Jewish and save Jewish lives. We could not have accomplished what we've done over the last 31 years without the, the support that we're getting, not only from, from, from the, 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 the Canadian supportive community, and, but uh, the worldwide. And you should know there's an interesting phenomenon that's happening. We're getting support now from people who were once non-Jewish Christians. They're coming out and becoming Noahides because of our uh, incredible um, 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 educational programs. And so we're getting support from people who have abandoned Christianity and through the teachings that Rabbi Skobik teaches uh, Noahides as well, we have an incredible worldwide movement of non-Jews who are celebrating the seven laws of Noah. It's pretty amazing. And this all this all making a big difference. It's too bad that you're raising that now just at the end because that in and of itself could be a whole other topic. I remember you know what? You'll have Rabbi, have Rabbi Skobek on and he'll talk about it. Right. Fascinating, fascinating piece in and of itself. Julius, very quickly, what, what website can people go to if they want to pick up some of your videos or learn some of from your so, resources? So or, Jews, or, Jewsforjudaism.ca is where you'll find our website. Uh, or, or, or Jews, like with the word for. And, and the word for J E W S F O R J U D A I S M dot C A Jews for Judaism dot C A the words, and on YouTube just type in Jews for Judaism will be our icon should go up. We have over, almost four hundred videos there, and what, the interesting phenomenal phenomenon about our videos is much has changed since we started, and about half of our content now is just about Judaism. So uh, if, if people don't have to be interested in counter missionary work to really benefit from the programming that we're offering there. Again, over 200 videos on all aspects of Judaism. And right. uh, it, it's phenomenal, very interesting. And a lot of it, almost all of it, most of it is Rabbi Skobak, and he's, he's, he's pretty good. So what you're saying then is during the next uh, lockdown, we can all go make popcorn and we can binge watch your videos. Amazing. You, can be, you, don't, you don't need a lockdown to binge watch. <laughs> okay. Julius, thank you so much. We're so happy everyone's had a chance to join us.